और This is Miriam Raftery with the East County Magazine Show on KNSJ 89.1 FM Descanso. And today, my very special guest is Erica Pinto, the first woman chair of the Hamul Indian Village and the newly elected chair of the Southern California Indian Health Council. She was also recently honored with the Warrior Award, the American Indian Chamber of Commerce's highest honor for her leadership to improve the lives of Native people. Erica, welcome to the show, and it's such an honor to have you here today with us. Thank you, Miriam. I can remember when I was first elected as chairwoman back in 2015, I, I did have a real short interview with you back in then, so it's good to join you again. Good to see you. We too. did. Well, a lot has happened since then. So let's start, though, if we could. I, I want to get your reaction to the breaking news out of Washington, D.C. this week about President-elect Biden. Uh, nominating the first Native American, a woman, um, Deb Holland, as the Secretary of the Interior. I understand that, that you've met her. Tell us your reaction to this news. Well, I first of all, I knew she was going to be selected. I, had, I just had a feeling in my heart. I know that uh, President-elect uh, Joe Biden wants a diverse cabinet, and he's doing such a phenomenal job at making sure, you know, every Every person is covered in, in the White House cabinet. Deb Holland, Congresswoman Deb Holland, I have run into her a few times. I've met her a couple of times. I've spoken with her on the phone also. She is an exceptional choice. She will uh, make us proud. She's going to represent the people well. And I'm just so, I'm, I'm so proud. I'm, it's a historic moment. I, I think all of Indian country agrees with me when we say that he is, he is just creating an awesome cabinet and she's a, the best choice. Yeah, well, that's very encouraging to hear. Mm -hmm. So as far as the Southern California Indian Health Council that you're now the chair of, mm -hmm. can you give our listeners and, and viewers here a little bit of background on it? How many clinics does that cover? Mm -hmm. How many tribal members does it provide health care for in Southern California and here in San Diego County? Well, first, thank you for um, having me here to speak about Southern Indian Health Council. Any... Uh, way we can get them out is always a good publicity for them. Southern Indian Health Council services, most of East County, American Indians and uh, non-American Indians who live in the community of East County. So um, they have a clinic in Alpine. Mm -hmm. They also have another satellite clinic in Campo on the Campo Indian Reservation. They have a boys and girls club on La Posta Indian Reservation and um, it's a great organization. Services send seven consortium tribes of the East County, and each tribe has two representatives on the board. So it's a total of 14 board members, mix of alternates and delegates. And, and I had the pleasure of being elected last month. I don't take, I don't fall into my role until January of 2021, but I've been on the board for, you know, since 2004. I've been on and off and more consistently in the last seven years. Yeah. But this is such a much needed uh, service to the community. American Indians um, have many challenges, many health challenges. And so yeah, it's needed, us. it's there. Yes. Well, well, tell us what some of your goals are as the new chair. Well, first and foremost, it's always about finding ways to improve our health care finding ways and opportunities that we could get the best doctors, retain the best doctors. Um, I think that's been one of our challenges is, is um, holding on to our doctors because Campo is pretty far out there. You yeah. know, Alpine is, is a little bit remote, but not as far as Campo. And so we have to make, you know, people want to be out there and, and work for this organization, which is a fabulous organization. Uh, challenges we run into too are funding. You know, it just seems every year our funding from IHS gets cut, and we wow. need that funding to bring services to our people. Like I said, that one of the most vulnerable populations, you know, with diabetes and obesity and substance abuse. So we need this kind of service to 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 maintain ourselves and our health. Yeah, I know those have all been causes that you've long championed. Yes. And now, in addition to all of that, we have the COVID nineteen pandemic and I was just reading today um, uh, 
U.S. News and World Report had a troubling report about the death rate from COVID-19 nationally is twice as high among Native Americans as among white people. Mm -hmm. Is that disparity occurring in the Southern California region? And if so, what can be done about it? I don't see it occurring in the Southern California region. I do see it in other states, unfortunately. Yeah. But here we've been so fortunate to be um, having our clinic to be able to go to and and get tested if we start feeling any sort of symptoms. But um, thankfully, we've been we haven't been impacted. Are the clinics here getting enough of the personal protective equipment that they need? The tests, the I, I don't know if they have ventilators there, but whatever else they need beyond money, you know, the actual supplies and things during this. Thank you for asking that. We we do have enough PPE. Um, we have staff there that's ready to help us. We do uh, things different now where if I have an appointment up there, I have to go and stay in my car and, you know, get checked out yeah. and call in first and do a telehealth visit first. So everything's a lot different, different but we do have the proper uh, PPE to, to maintain ourselves. Well, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. How many cases of COVID have occurred locally, do you know, on the local reservations or among local, I guess, non-reservation uh, Indians as well? Gosh, I, I don't have a number off the top of my head as far as the American Indians, but I know, like I said, fortunately, we have not been uh, hit as hard as I we were thinking we would be hit. Oh, that's good. Fortunate. Yes. Maybe the remote locations of some of the reservations may be an advantage in a way. They're not in those crowded urban areas where it's spreading so fast. Well, you know, I think we we have uh, we know that our population is vulnerable. So I, I know a lot of the tribal leaders, you know, take great caution and they make sure that their communities are safe. And they, mm -hmm. I know one of my good friends who's a chairwoman refuses to travel anywhere. She does everything on Zoom, shopping on Zoom or shopping, you can't shop on Zoom, but you, you shop online. And mm -hmm. so I, I just think we have a tendency to take this more serious, you know, than um, some people that I've seen on social media. But uh, it, it, that's, there's a reason why we do that because we could be impacted, you know, if it spreads like wildfire in our yeah. community. Well, and Thank especially you. now with the ICU units, uh, as of last night, they're at zero zero percent capacity for Southern California, and our local hospitals are now turning ambulances away in some cases. So it's it's really you know very serious. How is the pandemic impacting the tribes economically, uh, Chairwoman? C can you tell us? I know it must be very difficult because they need their casinos and things open and the other businesses, it's not only about the jobs, but it's about, about you know, bringing in revenues to pay for things like education and health care. But how are they balancing, you know, the economic need versus the health care concerns right now? Well, I know the tribes have taken a hit economically through the closures. And I can't speak for any other tribe, but I can speak for ourselves that when we were hit and our casinos are essential to our operation of tribal government. And as you mentioned, of healthcare and of just mm -hmm. taking care of our communities. So we do believe that they are essential for our survival. And during the closures, we did take it upon ourselves to really delve into how can we open safely? How can we make sure our patrons are safe? How can we make sure our team members are safe as well as our tribal members? We have 72 tribal members only at Hamul who are um, tribal members. So they are, in my eyes, what I focus on first and foremost. I focus on the business. I focus on the rest of the people that come onto the reservation, but I want to make sure my tribal members are safe. And so far they are all very well. Uh, okay. We took those two months of closure and we just put our heads down. We connected with Southern Indian Health Council as well as other tribes. And we came up with a safe reopening plan that was blessed by the, I don't wanna say blessed, um, we got input from Southern Indian Health Council, the medical director, as well as staff who would come in and they would look at our document and they would say, oh, perhaps you should change this right here. Or maybe it would be better if you did this. And we just worked um, nonstop in those two months to make sure everybody's protected. You know, we purchased things before opening. So when you walk into our casino, there's a, a thermal, camera so it can measure many people's temperatures at once and if you have 
an elevated temperature, you will not be in welcome, unfortunately, inside our casino because, you know, go home and, and rest if you have an elevated temperature. Yeah, no, that's and a good, good thing, I think. The good, and, and, and also good positive thing is that we have one entrance and one exit. So we can really get a handle on who's coming in and who's leaving, uh, which is a good thing for us. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Um, the, um, the vaccine, of course, is on the horizon. My daughter just got hers this week. She's working in a COVID-19 ward, actually, an ICU unit. Um, so that's exciting. Are, are the tribes, do you think that most tribal members are going to be wanting to get the vaccine or is there hesitation? I know in the Black community, we've heard some concerns that, you know, people, some people of color are concerned about it. Um, how is that playing out from what you're hearing in the Native American community? I actually do hear mixed reviews. You know, on one hand, everybody's blessed that this vaccine has come about and it's being delivered. Mm -hmm. um, but also on the other hand, there's some still lingering mistrust, you know, in that um, back many, many, many years ago, um, when vaccines were distributed among certain communities, it, it wasn't a good thing. And, and I don't know if you know this, but back in the 70s, there was, uh, you know, um, forced sterilizations of uh, making women infertile. Oh, it was horrible. Um, I, I've, that I've was, heard, heard about that. There's some real horror stories that, that have happened some, that, are, that are unforgivable. And, um, how do you feel about the, the way the testing? The Go ahead. Yeah. And throughout the world, you know, there, there's just been some incidences that occurred like that, that, right. that does make people feel a little hesitant in, in trusting something like a vaccination. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that it will help. Dr. Fauci, you know, has come out and spoke about this and we do have a tendency to trust science. I do. At right. least. So uh, it could be a good thing. My mom herself said she's going to take the vaccine. I'm I'm open to take the vaccine. I wonder how's your daughter faring? Is she in pain? Does she have any? So far, just a sore arm from what I understand, yes, that's which, which what you I get understand. from any, any vaccine. So, so far, you know, so good. I guess we all have to weigh whatever risk the vaccine may carry versus the risk of contracting COVID-19. Exactly. So, you know, that, that's important. Um, back to the Hummel Casino for a moment. I. Eventually, we'll be out of this pandemic, hopefully, with the vaccine, especially on the horizon. Maybe in a few months, we can get life back to normal where more people will feel comfortable going out and, you know, being in, in going back to holding events and things. But I understand that the Humboldt Casino has a really exciting new rooftop venue that they've added. Tell us about that. Well, this rooftop is gorgeous. It has spectacular views of a land to the south of us, which is mm -hmm. California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So you see vast mountains and hills and, and uh, right now it's a little uh, brown because we had lack of rain, but it's still mm -hmm. beautiful nonetheless. And you could see some wildlife there, some coyotes and deer, and I think someone saw a bobcat, but um, wow. it's gorgeous. Uh, this is a space that's available for events to be held, weddings, you know, parties. Mm -hmm. It's outdoors. The roof actually uh, retracts to, so you can see the sky. But if, wow. if it rains and you're having an event, you can close it up. And it's just a gorgeous event. I was there last night taking a look at it. It's a bit cool right now, but in the summer, it's gorgeous. And the windows can come down. And if you're looking for an event, Miriam, we're happy to host you. Please come out and check it out. Um, you it's know, gorgeous, you're, you're reading my season. mind. I was just thinking what a lovely place this would be when this is all done and we can go back to holding, you know, either fundraising events or bring our East County Dining Club out there and have your wonderful caterers maybe, you know, uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful venues in East County. I, I've eaten at your steakhouse and enjoyed the views and all the wildlife and I can only imagine even how much more expansive the views from the rooftop must be. So that's something that we can look forward to. And very enjoy. gorgeous. And I do look forward to hosting you out there and your East County Club. Thank you. That's very kind. Tell us about your Warrior Award. Uh, what efforts were recognized with this great honor? Gosh, I really don't know what. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I often talk with my mom and my uncle, who's a former chair and, um, we often talk about how how the job that we do is, is not a job that we do for recognition or 
you know, to be uh, praised because it's a quite challenging job. And, you know, I've turned gray a lot since the last five years and since the last I've spoken with you, but um, I love what I do. Maybe it shows I'm passionate about my people. I'm passionate about the job we do. And I want to improve lives all around, you know, not just my community, my tribal members, but um, the lives of the Hamul community, the lives of the community that uses Southern Indian Health Council. Mm -hmm. I don't know what exactly, um, I think maybe just my effort, um, I was awarded for that. And I was so humbled and honored to be acknowledged that way because I don't ever expect it. And when it does happen, uh, I'm just blown away. So, yeah. well, you've done a lot. And I know I've seen the charitable efforts that your tribe has made to help mm -hmm. some of these various causes of, I think it was, was it addiction? And you remind me uh, of all veterans, of Veterans, homelessness. Homelessness, you know, yeah. The really cool thing is that um, given that we do generate revenue, we're able to give back to the communities. We just are working with Sharp Grossmont Hospital on um, a contribution. Hopefully it will help. I know the beds are at a 0% capacity and, yes. and it means a lot to us to be able to give back to something like that. That's going to help many people, not just myself or my people, but many people across, you know, the city, across the County of San Diego. Well, that's a wonderful thing to do. I yeah. want to circle back for just a second to the appointment of, uh, Deb Holland for Secretary of the Interior. Can you give us some specifics of some of the things that you or the other others in the Native American community are hoping that that she may do that will be different than what we've seen from some of the prior uh, secretaries of the Interior, particularly maybe the current administration, especially? What kind of a contrast can we expect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have somebody in a position such as a Secretary of the Interior someone who looks like you and understands uh, the challenges that we face as American Indian people, such as mm -hmm. Deb Holland, she's from New Mexico, and um, she understands what we face, you know, land and the trust issues, funding issues, um, healthcare issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, many... Um, uh, what Respect for the environment and... Uh, environment, yeah. that's one thing she did talk about, about um, mm -hmm. uh, preserving coastal places and planting uh, 30 million trees, I think it was by, by the year 2030 wow. and so forth. So she's all about the environment. She carries a torch for all the issues that we face and she understands. So I think that with that better understanding comes uh, you know, more room for better decisions that service all American Indian people. And, and I don't think that was a, an understanding that you know, the past um, representatives in that position had but she comes with all of that. She comes as a tribal person, which I greatly respect. She's respected in the Indian community. And I'm just looking forward to working with her because we could really use some land in the trust. And hopefully, you know, she'll be able to help tribes with that, with getting some land back. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you have the last word today, Chairwoman Pinto. What else would you like people in East County to know that we haven't already um, talked about today? Well, it's not going to be about myself, right? I'm, I'm gonna, so. <laughs> I'll leave uh, that open-ended. Okay, it's open-ended. You know what I want? Um, I know this year has been very challenging for all of us. Yeah. Uh, Thanksgiving was a lot different this year. Uh, I know families weren't together, and it's it's just tough. And Christmas, it's going to be the same thing. You know, it, there will be time that we get to gather. Um, I look forward to that. And right now, I think we could only do what's right and do our part in making sure that we, you know, kick this virus in the ass. I'm sorry, but we just need to get rid of it. And, and so we can be together. And so you can come out and visit us at the rooftop. And, and so we can hug each other again and, and not have wow. Zoom malfunctions and, and people get upset. But I, I can't wait for that to happen. I just want people to do their part. And uh, let's all be there for each other because it's really... I can see a lot of people struggling, you know, some of my elders struggle in, uh, in having a hard time and not having that human contact. So let's be gentle on each other and respect each other, whether you believe in Christmas or whether you believe in happy holidays or whatever you celebrate and believe in. I, I just wish that we all would respect one another as I feel like under this administration, it, it wasn't always that way or enforced or encouraged. And so my hope is 
we do do that in a new year. And I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I know uh, we'll get through it. And I just want people to hang in there. Well, those are very wise words. And I certainly agree with that, with that message for the new year. Eric, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on the East County Magazine radio show on KNSJ 89.1 FM Descanso, the network for social justice. Thank you.